Hi, um, thank you very much for having me. Uh, my name is Masaru Kajimoto. I'm an assistant professor at the Journalism and Media Studies Center, the University of Hong Kong. Um, here's our website, and this is me. So today, I will mainly talk about a little experiment I did with my colleagues and students over the last summer. Uh, this project is called Weiboscope in English. And before I get into the details, I think I need to explain what Weiboscope is in the first place. So Weiboscope is a um, brainchild of my colleague, Dr. Fu Kim Wa. You can see his profile on our website as well. Um, unfortunately, he cannot be with us today because he's currently visiting MIT's Media Lab as a Fulbright Scholar. And I think he's doing all sorts of interesting things with technology there, but he cannot be here. Uh, anyway, so Weiboscope project. Kinwa collects and archives censored data from Chinese social media called Sina Weibo. According to some news reports, Sina Weibo has about 200 million active users. And those active users post around 100 million messages every day. But researchers find out that 30% of the 100 million posts are censored within 30 minutes every day and 90% of those posts are deleted within 24 hours. Uh, we are not quite sure what's happening in here, but we, we are guessing that they have sort of blacklisted words, which, um, so the Weibo users use those blacklisted words, their posts will be automatically deleted by the system. And if it's a really, really sensitive post, maybe the government's uh, asking Weibo Sina company to delete those posts, I think. But anyway, that's where Kinwa's Weiboscope comes in. Um, here it is. So the way it works is that his system identified uh, very popular Weibo microbloggers, right, uh, who have more than 1,000 followers. So his system follows these um, popular microbloggers on Sina Weibo. His system also follows some group of uh, microbloggers who are constantly censored on the platform. And he also uses some uh, random sampling technique to include uh, more representative samples of the Weibo posts. So anyway, he archives all those posts into his system, and he does this frequently in order to determine what is being censored. The way, again, the way it works is that so you have a group A that are, you know, archived, let's say now. 15 minutes later, you archive all those data. So it's group B. The system compares group A and group B and realize what is missing in group B. So those posts that appear in group A data set doesn't appear in group B. So that's what we call censored posts. And the Weiboscope sort of uh, collect those and then make those censored posts publicly available outside of the mainland China. So that's the Weibo scope and how it works. And it has um, lots of um, other functions, like this one is one censorship index. So it sort of tries to visualize the data as well. But if you're a researcher, you can actually download uh, raw data uh, from our website, right? Um, also, Weiboscope has this um, translation system. All those censored posts in Chinese are machine translated into English. But, you know, as you can imagine, machine translation is not that good at this stage. So many of the English translation actually makes no sense. Um, so that's why we decided to bring this project to the next level by sort of picking we cannot possibly translate everything. So we pick some interesting censored posts manually and then translate those into English by ourselves. So this idea of translating um, Weiboscope became possible when we learned about this uh, app called uh, Bridge developed by Midan. Uh, let me see. So I guess I should explain um, what Bridge is and what Midan is. So here's Midan's website. And if you're interested, you can read all about um, the details about their two main products. So they have Czech 
and also bridge, right? Check up is for very uh, uh, social media verification, I think. And bridge is for crowd translation, right? Uh, they are developing these two tools to help journalists and also citizen, well, citizen journalists, right? Miran is also a member of the Fast Draft News Coalition along with uh, Google News Lab and Story4, right? So for the Weibo Scope in English project, we have worked with An Xiaomina from Miran. She is the director of product there and Here's her Twitter account. If you want to get to know her more, you can follow her, I think. So we worked with um, Anne for Weiboscope English project. So anyway, here's the bridge app we used for the project. It's a crowdsourced translation app. Uh, when we did this, this app was still in early beta stage and it also had a Chrome extension, and that one was in alpha stage. So we were not only experimenting to see how translating censored social media content from Chinese to English will help the outside world understand China better, but also testing out the app itself to help Miran improve the app's functionality. So, you know, if I say so myself, our collaboration worked really well. It was a win-win relationship because they were helping us to bring the Weiboscope um, to the next level. And at the same time, we were, hopefully, we were helping their uh, product development. So with Weiboscope in English project, we fed all the censored posts from Weiboscope to our account on Bridge, shared by four student volunteer translators who are all studying journalism at our university. So we intentionally coincided the timing of the project with this year's anniversary of Tiananmen Square student protest crackdown around June 4th, which is a very sensitive topic in mainland China, as you can imagine. We have instructed those four students to pay particular attention to the censored content related to June 4th, and then translate um, those posts using the hashtags like uh, Tiananmen Square and June 4th. A great feature of the Bridge app is that they can work together. I mean, students can work together collaboratively even though they were not physically together because the app will show the other students' translation within uh, the system and other students can build on that. So if you have an iPhone, if you're using Bridge app, you see all the censored content being fed to your account. And if you're a group member studied translating, you will see that translation as well. And not only you can improve the translation, you can also write translator's notes to give an extra content or give to explain your translation. So it gives little context to the translation. And this taking note function turned out to be quite useful uh, in our usage because the netizens in mainland China use lots of slangs and implicit language when discussing sensitive topics for obvious reasons. So it helped our students greatly. We set up a dedicated Twitter account and Facebook page to automatically feed those translations, as you can see on these screens. So I will show you first the Facebook page. So when students translated um, censored Weibo posts, they appeared in here. Right, and we had many followers on this Facebook page. We also had Twitter accounts and all the translations were fed in here on this platform with the translations as well as students' notes. Now let me show you how it works on my iPhone screen. So here's my iPhone and I open the bridge and I need my glasses <laughs> to look at the screen. All right, so here, for example, I have a censored posts and two students translated these. And as you can see in here, you see the translations and then also students notes to sort of explain the context of the translation. So it works really handy. If you're a translator, when your group mate translates, it also appears in here like this. So you can sort of um, 
have a discussion with each other within the app. So that's how a bridge works. All right. Now, my colleague at JMSC, um, her name is Ann Kruger. You can see her profile on this page. She also worked with this project, and she interviewed one of the student volunteers, Natalie Long, to share her experience with you. So I will play back that video now. I want to get straight into it and know what was the experience like for you? Like, how were you actually interacting with this app? Was it quite a formal way, or was it something that you could do on the run? Yeah, since it's a mobile app, I could actually check the tweets on Weibo and uh, while I'm traveling uh, from school to home. And when I have a free evening, say, so I would open my laptop and work on the Chrome extension. So it's a bit of both. Yeah. So did it feel a little bit like you're engaging with social media and your value adding to the posts that you're seeing? Yeah, basically? definitely, because it gives a... Uh, gives the English-speaking world a glimpse of what netizens in China are talking about, especially it, those are censored posts on sensitive topics. Yeah. Which is exactly what we were focusing on. Our focus was on the anniversary of June the 4th, the Tiananmen Square crackdown. So were there any particular posts that you worked on that you found really interesting or that stood out to you? Uh, so for June 4th, we observed that a lot of people actually have a way to skirt around the censorship. So they put the sensitive content in a screenshot, so it's less easier to screen those texts because it's in an image format. So and there are also a lot of art or memes that, uh, and people actually refer to June 4th in many different ways to you know, avoid the censorship. So that was really interesting. What were some of the things that they were actually saying? So, okay, this is how they're talking about the, the issue, how were they discussing it? Uh, sometimes they were um, posting poems, you know, um, showing that uh, one year has gone by but there were no justice brought to those people who were victims. And then uh, sometimes they, uh, it was just uh, posting emojis of candles, so that was censored too. So uh, it shows how the authorities are you know, um, understanding those posts. Mm, okay. Well, were there any other memorable posts besides June 4? Because obviously there's a lot of things yeah. happening at, at this time and you're working on the project. Any other things that you noticed? Uh, I remember there was um, a foreign minister of China, Wang Yi, and then he was answering a question from a Canadian reporter uh, who asked him something about human rights in China and then he responded by saying, you don't have the right to ask that. And that was really ironic and it was all over the internet. And there are a lot of censored posts about that as well. Yeah, I remember that. And of course, we were able to find out about that in English because it was a Canadian reporter. What, yeah. what were they talking about in Chinese? And I remember there was a post, uh, uh, actually someone digged up some other rude uh, responses that the minister had before uh, when responding to a foreign reporter. So. Uh, yeah, so people remembered what he said some years ago. So how was the sentiment towards him? Were they critical? Yeah. yeah. And that was censored, obviously. Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, I want to talk a little bit about the, the power of crowdsourcing in English because you understand the Chinese and you get to see both and you get to see the nuances, what's happening in Chinese, what's being censored, what's, what's happening in English with some of those posts. But just tell me a little bit about what you think that this type of app can bring to the rest of the world, just from, from your experience. Um, it helps people understand some of the slang that the Chinese netizens are using online. And uh, I think the app itself, you can see what other translators are translating and we could actually review and comment on those uh, and improve on that. So it makes everything the experience smoother for everyone when viewing it. And um, I think for the app, there's also a, fun a feature for you to add some remarks, so it gives context for the translation. Right. And, and did you find that particularly helpful with most of the uh, stories and posts that you were translating? Did, were you able to translate most of it on your own or did you really rely on other people putting, giving their input as well? Yeah. It, um, 
Sometimes I had to, you know, ask other translators, translators on my team, what the particular slang was was about, or uh, we have to refer to some news reports if it's a, a if it's a really local story that we may not have full knowledge of that. So, so we have to provide the context as well. So everyone's piecing together little little pieces of the puzzle and, and putting it together. Yeah. And did you happen to notice with just even with your own social network circles, were friends picking up on what you were doing? Uh, yeah, so when I shared the page or Twitter, some actually there was a j journalist from Storyful. He was really excited about this project and uh, he looked forward to our tweets. I think this shows that uh, it really helps different journalists uh, pick up stories and find other angles on China as well. And you get that accurate translation, yeah. that quality translation. Great. Well, thank you, Natalie, for sharing all that with us. And I also briefly talked with another student volunteer, Tom Tsui, and I asked him what his experience was like. So here's the video of me interviewing Tom. Can you first sort of share your overall experience? Mm, I think the overall experience is yeah. quite interesting because right. uh, Usually, in people in other countries, they don't yeah. usually care. Like, uh, they don't usually get ex access to the Chinese social media Weibo. Right. And I think this project is a good chance for like people in other countries to get yeah. to know more about what's going on in China and what, what's mm -hmm. popular on the social media and what's getting censored right now. Okay. Yeah. Right. Well, we coincided the project with the Tiananmen Square crackdown yeah. anniversary, right? Um, what do you think about that? I mean, was there any particular Weibo post that sort mm. of... Actually, yeah. I was expecting to have more posts on okay. that day, right. but then it ended up that there isn't really that many posts uh -huh. on Weibo that get yeah. censored. Right. And maybe, I don't know if it's because like people, the event has already passed like uh -huh. for many years already, right. and people right. are starting to forget about it. Right. And yeah, that's kind of shocking because I think that's quite an inter important incident in China, but people are like starting to like lose attention about. Right, but that, that's also uh, yeah. one thing that we learned from this kind of project, yeah. right? If they are really losing interest, the Weibo kind of serves as a window for us to see what, you know, how people are not paying that much attention. Mm -hmm. I see. Um, so you have many classmates at you know, University of Hong Kong who do not speak Chinese, right? Do you think this kind of sort of translation project would help them understand what's going on in Hong Kong as well, yeah. as well as in China? Yeah, certainly. Yeah. Because uh, in Hong Kong, you have a lot yeah. of students from like many other countries, even right. for those in like Asia, like Korea right. or Japan, right. they right. don't usually look at the Chinese social media because right. they're, they're also using the Western kind of social right. media or right. they have their own ones. Right. Right. So, if we don't translate this into right. English, I don't right. think like these people will ever get to learn about what's going on over there. This project yeah. serves as a very good like tool for right. us to try sharing yeah. what's going on on the social media right. in I China. I think that, to that's the reason people. why it's called yeah. bridge. Right? Yeah. It's sort of bridging exactly. the two different social groups. What about yourself? Did you learn anything? I mean, obviously, translation helped other people mm -hmm. who do not speak Chinese to understand what's going on. But what about yourself? Did you learn anything personally? Like the first thing, as yeah. I just mentioned, is right. that I learned about how this event is losing interest right. in China. Right. And the second thing is that right. I really realized was how there is a linguistic difference between China okay. and Hong Kong, even right. though we're both like using <laughs> okay. the same right. language. because. Right. Like China is kind of segregated, isolated from uh -huh. the other like world, right. so that there's a lot of like word difference uh -huh. and even a lot of like slangs on internet that it's that oh, would be okay. sound kind of confusing to me in the right. beginning. But right. I have to, but after looking it up, and uh -huh. I'll actually get it. But yeah, these are the two things that I noticed. Oh, okay, all right. I think Natalie mentioned that uh, sometimes those Chinese netizens intentionally modify words so it yep. doesn't get censored or yeah, sometimes yeah. they do screen capture and add the picture instead of using the text yes. that's what you know it's harder for the authorities to censor that kind of content have you also noticed the same trend or yeah i also noticed yeah. the same thing but yeah. what i also noticed is yeah. how the chinese 
government is reacting quickly to this kind of <laughs> like okay. like I see. Er right. alternative that right. that the netizens came up with yeah. because like there are a lot of posts which use yeah. this screenshot or modified uh -huh. words, but they still got censored instantly. So uh, okay, I see. I see like how the Chinese government is yeah. developing. Like while the uh -huh. Chinese netizens are yeah. finding new ways to yeah. talk about these sensitive topics, yeah. the Chinese government is also looking for more like methods to stop them from talking, the uh, same talking about this. Okay. Yeah. All right. What about the the app itself? Did you find it? Easy to use. Mm. What, what did you use? You had iPhone, right? Yeah, I had iPhone. Oh, okay, so you used the iPhone app. Yeah. yeah. Mm, I think in general, yeah. like the the app, it's quite. Uh, it was in beta, so I'm yeah, sure there are. It was there still in development, yeah. so there's yeah. a lot of uh, like room for improvement. Right, right. But then I think the app in general is quite yeah. good because. We can review each other's work, but right. there's a problem that yeah. when you review the other's work, you uh -huh. can't actually edit it. I think. Uh, so okay. if you they can edit others, yeah. yeah. Okay. If you if they can like add like uh, work on that function uh -huh. and make it better, I think it will make the app better. Okay. Yeah. But what about this idea itself? You can translate any time you want mm -hmm. because it's in your iPhone. Yeah. Right. When you are waiting for a train, for example you have five minutes to kill, then you translate, mm -hmm. right? Or you are, I don't know, uh, in a very boring lecture <laughs> on <laughs> campus, and <laughs> you don't want to listen to the lecture, so you do translate. Did you actually do that? How, how did you find time for this mm, project? Sometimes yeah. I was doing yeah. it when I was like having dinner or something, because... Okay. Having like, dinner? Yeah, because I have, a, I have the habit of using my phone during dinner, so I can like okay. multitask while eating. <laughs> Well, we ran this experiment for about two weeks, and I think it went really well. I also like this particular post about China's foreign minister that Natalie talked about. Um, it's on the screen right now. And this um, Weibo micro blogger says that it's not the first time that their foreign minister said something nasty like this to uh, reporters from foreign countries. Right? I mean, this not only shows that netizens in China are actually getting information even though that news item is censored, they also remember some of those old news and they can actually link uh, those news um, to the current affairs. And I thought it was fascinating. Um, at least it was fascinating to me because I could sort of like, you know, have a glimpse of what sort of things that people discuss behind the Great Firewall in the mainland China. So next year, we are planning to make this project even bigger. We will work with Miran again, and we are planning to recruit many more students to be involved in the group translation. Our hope is that the more translators we have, the better the translations would become, and also we can cover more topics. I see a huge potential in this uh, crowdsourced translation project because the use case shouldn't be just limited to censored posts, right? This can be easily expanded to other languages and countries. For example, we know that Twitter is big in Japan. It would be very interesting to see if people in Japan can crowd translate some of the influential tweets into English. I think it's a perfect tool for both journalists and citizens, especially when we have like breaking news situations in other countries. Normally, when we have breaking news, the initial news reports are all in a foreign language that we don't understand. This kind of app will definitely help us to understand what's going on better. Well, if you want to know more about us, JMSC, or Weiboscope, or Weiboscope in English, or Midan and Bridge, please don't hesitate to contact us. Um, you can find me on JMSC website. I tweet at Masaru KJ and you also see my uh, email address there. So please, don't, uh, please feel free to contact us. Well, thank you very much again for having me. I hope this session was useful for you. Bye.